We were just looking at a, a look back at 2015, and we begin a new year very much the way we ended it. Global growth worries have defined markets around the world. These worries have underpinned a massive market meltdown in 2016 for the global market, with that slowdown in China unraveling expectations and certainly global equity values. Stocks in the U.S., for one, beginning the year with the worst performance of any year. Chinese markets right now near bear market territory, and European stocks currently at multi-year lows. Of course, the story of oil, one of the major issues here, oil prices cut in half over the last year, and while many people say this is going to be a catalyst for good times, so far it has been an indicator of what's wrong with the global story. The shadow cast from China hanging over the United States with fears of a recession in the U.S. coming this year. Only time will tell how this plays out, but we have assembled a first-class panel for you this morning to talk about it. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. We are joined right now by Paul Singer, founder, chief executive officer, and co-chief investment officer, Elliott Management. Martin Sorrell is CEO of WPP. And then we have Zhu Min, Deputy Managing Director, International Monetary Fund. And also joining the panel this morning, Ken Rogoff, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Carlos Ghosn sends his apologies. He is en route from Zurich as we speak. Thanks very much for being here, gentlemen. Paul, let me kick this off with you. Do you agree with the assessment that was just made in terms of what's behind this market meltdown? How do you see the state of the world today? I think the... Um uh, one of the key uh, elements to uh, be thinking about global markets and the uh, strange uh, initial uh, reaction is that um, for seven years the world has been, uh, the developed world uh, directly and the rest of the world indirectly has been existing on a diet of um, complete reliance, virtually complete reliance on central banks and central bank action uh, really a continuation of the emergency action after the global financial crisis, during and after the global financial crisis, um, uh, to uh, hold up the uh, global economy. What I mean is 0% interest rates, uh, morphing in some places into negative interest rates, quantitative easing, which I believe is the effective equivalent of uh, money printing, has, uh, has given uh, has A, had a support, of course, of the global economy, but B, has given presidents, prime ministers, congresses, parliaments, uh, sort of cover to basically do nothing in the way of structural reform. So the, um, the developed world has been uh, growing very slowly over the last seven years. Um, uh, there isn't much room for error. Uh, and I think it's, a, I think it's, a, um, it's been a, um, uh, a very uh, distorted policy mix. The prices, obviously, of stocks and bonds are distorted by what uh, amounts to date uh, to 15 or so trillion dollars of central bank bond buying and uh, stock buying also. But um, also the distortion is in uh, that the best part of the global economy is uh, how investors are doing, how financiers are doing, how uh, upper income people are doing. And the middle class has been not participating. And so after seven years to get to the answer to your question, Right. After, after some context, um, there may be a transition of the way investors feel about um, um, feel about the um, uh, the central banks as uh, in terms of uh, complete confidence. I'm glad you mentioned banks. the central banks. That's a, really a critical part of this story. And in this panel this morning, we're talking about future shocks, how to navigate through them, and whether or not this is a, a lot steeper than anyone uh, expected. And by the way, in about 20 minutes, I do want to open it up to all of you. We've got some uh, really so many smart, global-minded people in the audience, and certainly we want to hear what you have to add to the conversation as well. Uh, Min, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I heard you use the words meltdown. I so tend to disagree. I understand that I'm taking huge risk at the beginning to disagree with the moderator. So I expect to some unexpected consequence for my disagreements. So you're disagreeing <laughs> on the assessment of what's behind this meltdown that we've seen the, in global markets. No, the first issue is I don't think mar market melted down. Okay. The market in the process adjustments. Because if you see, I mean, if you see interest rates is on upside, the growth did not pick up 
follow the interest rates on the up, the market valuation have to be adjusted, right? Yeah, good point. Yeah, we in, have in lost next, $2 trillion in market value yeah, in, the next in two and a half weeks. That's why I called it no, meltdown. When market adjusts with all these uncertain volatilities, it can be overshooted. But it's not the market meltdown. I would say in the next 12 months, if you see the interest continue on the upside, if the growth not a pickup as strong as interest pickup why, indicated, why, why, why did the, melt, why the market was the melt, Why was the meltdown delayed? Why didn't it happen immediately after the Fed? It's a great it? question. Yeah, what took, what took the market so long to figure out that the economy was a lot weaker than people expected? Well, when, when the Fed raised the rates, you have a very good point. The Fed did the, the good communication. People understand. We didn't have the real shakedown until after the new year. So was that, was that driven by concern also about China? Uh, China was a part of that, but I think the more important is at the end of the year, people see more growth story. Mm -hmm. Because the valuation is very much driven That's by before growth. before you started to drop your drop. GDP forecast. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, mean, I mean, I think the interest... I, think, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to play the key role here, okay? We do forecast, but we do reflect the global situation. I think that, that's a very important thing. So I think we should continue to have this idea in mind. We should continue the market to adjust forward. We, we should point out that the IMF has cut global growth expectations how many times in the last six months? Twice? No, that's very true because, because we see the growth getting slower and slower. Okay. But two points is very important. Number one, we still have a growth. 3.4% is But not growth. enough. 3.4% yeah, for the no. globe. Yeah, for the globe, yeah. Okay. I think we still have a growth. I think that's very yeah. important. It's, we're not below 2%. I think it's absolutely important. Number right. Two. And number two, on the growth side, we also did a study. We say in the next five years, the potential growth is not the growth is getting down uh, gradually. The potential growth is also getting down. In so the next longer year, term, you're looking long at growth coming growth down and down and down. Yeah. Exactly. So now, that's important, have important implications for the market. We probably will see more market adjustments for More on this, uh, on this market adjustment. Uh, but Ken, you have been a bear on China for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any question that what set off the most recent events and even the last half year has been concern about China. It doesn't mean that China's definitely growing slower, but it's sort of been the myth in the market that China could never, you know, have a business cycle, that it was just a constant, a perpetual growth machine. And I think that nervousness has kicked in. Now, coming to Paul's point, I mean, it, it isn't so much that it, the, the Fed hiking the interest rate microscopically is what's driven this. What's dri driving it is the central banks are not coming to the rescue. I mean, people have been saying, you know, when there's a recession, the Fed typically cuts interest rates four or five percent, and the European Central Bank maybe three percent. Well, there's no room to do that here. So I, I, I again stick my neck out a little bit, but I mean, I think the the next year is going to see a lot of risk uh, in emerging markets and in China. Russia and Brazil are already having recessions. I think the United States and Europe, you can have a recession in any year, but I, I wouldn't say you know, it's, it's incredibly elevated um, at, at, the, at, at, at the moment. I don't think it's a question of the Fed not coming to the rescue or central banks not coming to the rescue. I think, uh, in effect, they've been part of the problem by enabling uh, the complete lack of structural and fiscal reforms. Um, I believe the developed and the developing world is capable of, uh, and, and therefore I disagree that the uh, long-term growth rate of the world is trending uh, down. It doesn't, it has been, um, but it doesn't have to be. And what I mean is that um, a better mix of policies, uh, tax, regulatory, uh, uh, education, training, retraining. Um, let's just talk for a moment about uh, technological destruction. Um, everyone knows and everyone sees in 2015's markets that technological destruction in some industries has accelerated, the retailing industry, where we've known that clicks were going to uh, uh, replace uh, 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 going to the store. Um, but all of a sudden in 2015, important parts of the top line have been um, removed by just a couple of uh, uh, internet companies. Um, so. Um, I think the world could do a much better job of being more flexible in a rapid response when their industries or become competitive, uncompetitive, um, either because of the glo well, global I, competitive I, I, I really think it's much because more, of technological it's, destruction. It's much more complex than that, I think. And this is macro stuff. And so let's look at it from the firm level, the micro level. 
I, I think we underestimate the impact of that weekend in September 2008. The, the, Not, the weekend that Lehman went, they, went under. Yeah, the, the impact on consumers. You know, why, why has the oil price fall, which is effectively a tax cut, not had a more fundamental impact on consumer confidence? Because I think people are still cautious. At the corporate level, it's even worse. So let's take what Paul just said about technological disruption. So you have two situations. One, one is you're facing what we've just touched on, a world that is growing slowly, that post Lehman, with the, with the exception of the snapback in 2010, which surprised, it was V-shaped recovery. 11, 12, 13, 14 has been slow and steady growth with relatively no inflation, little inflation, therefore very little pricing power, therefore firms very focused, particularly legacy firms, on cutting costs. So that's one thing. Second thing is if you look at the spectrum in which you operate a legacy company, not a disruptor, at one end you have the disruption. You have Airbnb, you have Uber. Uber. Right. At the, using them as icons. At the other end, you have the 3G zero-based budgeters. I remind you that ABI now, the zero-based budgeting company, has a market cap of 200 billion. Its second string, Kraft Heinz, has a market cap of almost 100 billion. So we're talking about between the two in one sort of group, 300 billion. You have Coty buying 12 and a half billion worth of assets from Procter & Gamble, wreck it ben Kieser, all of that. So that's the other end. In the middle, you have people like Paul, Dan Loeb, Bill Aikman, Nelson Peltz, who are putting pressure on companies for short-term performance. The activists. Yes. They want now, change. If you put those three things together, that's a pretty difficult cocktail for a CEO who on average lasts five to six years, a CFO who on average lasts four to five years, and a CMO, a chief marketing officer, which obviously impacts our business particularly, who lasts two years. Hallelujah, that's up from 12 months ago when it was 18 months. Hmm. In that world... I don't think, what do we see? As Zoom said in the green room, we're not seeing capital investment. In fact, capital investment has come down recently. And you're not seeing pricing power. No pricing, pricing power. So, where is it? So, so the standard firm, if there is one, at the micro level, is unwilling to commit and make investments. Ironically, paradoxically, it is those companies that are protected by what the corporate governance wonks don't like, i.e. concentration of voting power, that I think are the best models. So if I take uh, a Rupert Murdoch, for example, uh, I'm not saying that because we happen to be on a Fox business program, but if I take a Rupert Murdoch, if I take a Roberts family, if I take a Zuckerberg at Facebook, as long- They have an ownership in the company, voting a geared, control. A geared structure, which offends corporate governance, you know, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote, but which gives the management the ability to take long-term decisions fundamentally. We joined the long-term group, a McKinsey, Dow, Larry Fink, BlackRock, he's, wrote, he's written, I think, to the chairman, CEOs of the S&P 500 twice, saying concentrate on the long term. That's right. So I think that's the fundamental thing that has to happen. Now, I think where Paul is absolutely bang on right is there are some fundamental things that you have to do to make corporates take a longer term view. Some of the things he mentioned, but education, technology. Well, they want to take a longer term view, but over the short term, they're not seeing the demand. No. I mean, there is a demand problem. Isn't that right? Yes, I don't believe so. Um, can I, uh, I'd like to respond to two things, uh, two themes that you just uh, talked about. One is the, um, the um, post-2008 uh, environment. Um, it, it felt implicit in your comment that, um, that it almost didn't matter what the policy mix was, that people were cautious, they uh, remained cautious, that impacted demand, uh, uh, that impacted the business climate. Um, I don't actually believe that's true, um, uh, that policy implicitly doesn't matter. I think better policies, more uh, growth supportive policies. You're talking about fiscal policy. You're talking about tax reform and regulation. Well, which, ha which hasn't come. Which hasn't come. It's monetary policy well, that's driven it. I mean, how do you explain But I'm Paul? saying that, 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 that it's the mix of policies uh, no, post 2008, no, not just the spirit no, of but caution. But there's fundamental things. How do you explain that companies are sitting on $7 trillion of net cash, at least, last time I looked at it, relatively unleveraged balance sheets? How do you explain the S&P 500 in 2014 paid back more in dividends and buybacks than it retained? In other words, it shrank. If you took S&P 500 as one firm, it shrank. It probably shrank also in 2015. So we've gone through two years where the biggest companies in the world have taken a view about the world economy which is limiting. 
and is not expansive. It has yeah. implications but for employment and everything. One of the main reasons why they're taking that view is that the policy uh, uh, landscape that they face in two respects um, supports the, those actions and that attitude. One is that the policy uh, mix does not, is not welcoming. Capital will go where it's welcome. So what do we, Absolutely. Have, to, what, what do we have to get governments to do? But, but I, I Stop would also, raising taxes. I would also put uh, in Deal here. with regulation and make regulation rational. This is I'm a, not a deregulator. This is a really good point because over the last seven years, all we've had was central bank policy. And so we haven't seen the kind of fiscal policies that you're talking about, Paul. Ken. But, but I'd also say the financial regulation that's come in uh, and the, also the general environment made it very hard for small and medium-sized businesses around the world to invest. That the, there are a lot of measures of monopoly power in major economies that's increased. And you know, I think these companies are holding back from investment, trying to regain pricing power, because they're not under pressure from the small and medium-sized businesses that might have been coming in and, and competing. It, gets, so I think it gets even worse, because the M&A activity that we saw last year, I think it was a record year. John, record year, yeah, M&A? Yeah, it's a record okay. year. Mm -hmm. So what was that activity? That was cost-based. You know, we ran out of options, or they ran out of options to reduce costs, so let's get another cost base in to reduce costs. And by the way, the way we analyze M&A, how do you analyze M&A if you're a commentator? You I have a comment it, about the M&A story in a minute I want to share with you. Yeah, I want to back to this investment issues, the $7 trillion, why they're sitting there, don't do anything. And Alan Greenspan showed me the one of his chart, tell me today, the corporate cash uh, investments to the cash ratio as a lower as a 1930. Mm -hmm. So why the corporate don't invest? I think that's the key question for the growth. We found today, in globally, in terms of investment to GDP shares today, is it below than 2007? Exactly. And when you speak with bankers today, and this is the point that I wanted to make, we just had Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan on the program the other day. And one of the issues I see is much of the lending that we're seeing to corporates, the lending is going toward M&A. Yeah. The lending is not going toward CapEx increases for companies to spend in their business. I think that's a telltale sign. Yeah, I think so. Set the policy framework to encourage a corporate sector to invest, provide the transparency and the certainty. I think the uncertainty is a big issue. If you ask the world, I think Martin, you ask a thousand CEOs around the world, why do you don't invest? People will say number one is uncertainty. The uncertainty about the market, about the future, about the growth, about the tax policy, Absolutely. and about the financial market, because the risk is so low, they expect risk going up, how far, how soon. So I think it's the key issue for the global policy maker in this world, to ensure you have a clear policy framework, transparency, give the business uh, section the certainty and lead them to invest in the futures. Right. We, we see so many uh, uh, new uh, technologies, innovations uh, uh, pump out, as Paul just mentioned. So there's a huge room for the investments. Infrastructure is needed everywhere. Yeah. Right? I believe and it's so $3.6 trillion, trillion dollars needed in America alone. Yeah. Bridges and roads uh, have deteriorated. Martin, doesn't, um, doesn't the interest rate landscape also encourage financial engineering? discourage bank lending, bank, mar bank lending margins are inherently um, uh, no, challenged no, no, when no, interest rates are based I, I, on zero. I, I, I agree with that, but it, it's, it's because, Paul, there is a short-term philosophy. Now, let me just come back to M&A for a minute. How do you, as an investor, evaluate M&A in the companies in which you invest? You look at the cost synergies that they get, you tax them, you apply appropriate multiple, and if the resultant sum is greater than the premium, it's a great deal. If it's less than the premium, it's a lousy deal. If that company comes out with revenue synergies, they get laughed out, right? You know, the interesting thing about SAB, Miller, and ABI, I remember, is if, if beer consumption in Africa rises to levels that we see in the Western world, that's a massive impact on the top line and profitability of SAB Miller. But those sort of things really get ignored. In fact, Lex, Breaking Views, and the others really laugh them out of court. It's a focus on cost. It's a focus on short term. And frankly, you know, I think activist investors do have a responsibility. Activist investors mm. tell us that they're long term, not short term. Yeah. I don't think that's how they're perceived. It depends on which act activist investor you're talking about. Certainly some are, are more short term than others. I mean, I, uh, let's, let's explore this for a moment because right. I think it's important and I think it's interesting. 
um, uh, and uh, provocative, but interesting that one of the... I'm deliberately trying to be provocative. Thank you. And I thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that one of the really good managers in, in, corporate, in the corporate world is raising this point. Um, um, uh, you don't have that many peers. At the uh, moment. It can always change. But uh, let's talk about it. Um, let's start with the concept of short-term and short-termism. A little known fact, um, um, uh, Elliot is uh, among the firms you mentioned as activist investors. It's only a part of what we do. We're a multi-strategy fund. But... Our equity positions, our activist positions, um, we, our holding period over a long period of time, we've measured this over many, uh, 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 many episodes, is longer than the average institutional holding of, of common stocks. The average institutional holding of common stocks is a year and a half or something like that. And ours is longer. Um, and when and you take an activist I, I can't position, speak. you're looking for change in how long? Well, can I address yeah, that in a moment? But, um, so, the entire world has drifted towards a shorter and shorter because this, this number, the institutional Driven holding by period, the incentives that fund managers get because the, you know, the criticism of corporate incentives, they're not long-term enough. Institutional investor incentives I agree with that. Are, are too short-term based. I but, agree with that. But, you know, whatever you say, the perception is, the perception is the reality, the perception is that activists are short-term. So what I would recommend is a very high-level, mainly television, corporate advertising campaign. But, but I think what position right. <laughs> what, what, uh, we appreciate the advice. We hope you don't charge for it. I love what, that. That is your solution. I think what Jim said Ken about... Ken Rubeff, go ahead. What Jim <laughs> said about uncertainty is a big driving force here. People are very nervous about what the long-term is, and that's holding back investment also. I mean, and if you want to know why there's short-termism, it's because they're nervous about the long-term. Right. But Ken, let me ask you, we, we started earlier on China. Should the global markets be reacting so closely and immediately to the happenings in China? I mean, do you think it's warranted for us to be so worried about the growth story of China right now? For emerging markets, absolutely. I mean, they're commodity exporters, not just oil exporters. This has been a big driving force. It's not all China. There's also just a cycle of investment. When metal prices are high, there's a big overinvestment. There are long lead and lag times. So there's, there's still new production coming online uh, in, in metals industries where they had no idea. I mean, the there's so much fall. oil in the world now on the global market. Is there any reason to believe that oil should be at $100 a barrel anytime soon. I mean, now you've got Iran oil coming back on the market as well. Listen, oil prices are so volatile. Never say never. I mean, you know, these things, there's no, the investments just disappeared. And, you know, if growth picks up, the prices are very sensitive to a couple million barrels. Um, I, you know, if uh, I, last year when I was here, I was asked what the price of oil would be in a year. And I said, I don't know, it might be 20, it might be 100. And I think if you're looking out two or three years, you just don't know. And look at the oil price. When you say history. you just don't know, you do know something. I mean, we've got more oil than you thought on the market. You know now. Would you say that now in the next few years, oil should be where it is? Is it priced properly? Oh, a oh, few years is a strong statement. Six months, okay. But a few years you can get, who knows where the global economy will be, we can soak up those few million barrels. And there's no investment going on. It's just completely collapsed in the oil sector. So that'll come back. But if I said to you, the, Mary, on the oil Mary, sector, I think that we have to understand there's a fundamental structure change. Number one, the shale gas share oil become the stream producer. Because of the technology, they can move in and move out. Their cost set the ceiling of oil costs. So I don't think the price will go back 100 uh, quickly. It's not easy because this is a big amount of oil output now today. I think that's a big structure change. On the supply side, OPEC clearly lost the monopoly power. So that's another issue. But they will not be able to set the ceiling of the price as they did. They only be able to set the bottom of the price. That means they compete to each other, they produce more, the price will on downside. If they can work together, they produce less, price can be up high enough, the shale gets shale or you move in. Push the class gun down. You know, Mar Martin was that's talking very about very important structure change. But Martin was talking about oil as being a real positive for the consumer, and over the last year, I think it's been more of a of an indicator 
of where we well, are in the world. But the counterbalance of the impact on the emerging markets or fast growth markets. But an, you have an, the Iranians coming into the oil supply situation as well. You have the Saudis unwilling to cut off, cut off oil and see the oil price and the impact on the, the economies. But just come back to, if I said to you, Maria, what was the price of oil per barrel when John Brown at BP bought Amoco and Arco in 2001? 2001, it? I want to say $10. It's yes, exactly right, 10 and $11. And we're complaining about you know, a $20 price. So, I mean, yeah, I remember, yeah. Volatile. But if you look at it, from a, again, from a micro point of view, from a CEO's point of view, you come to Davos, what do you think? I just jotted down before we started what are the major sort of risks that, that we and our company see. So China, oil, Saudi Arabia, migration in Europe and elsewhere, US political situation, Brexit, cyber. I mean, you put that little lot together, uh, what, what, what is anybody going to do when they're looking at their budgets for 2016 or beyond? They're going to be very conservative. So I think, I don't think this is a particularly gloomy scenario, but... The new normal is a low growth world where inflation is probably under too much control because we'd, we'd like a little bit of inflation to get some pricing power uh, for our clients and also to get something into the, the wage system. But I think that's the scenario that will continue. Combined this is the new the normal, low this growth. This is the new normal, yeah, yeah. low growth. Because by, by definition, the system couldn't sustain pre-layman growth rates because it blew up. By the end of this panel, I certainly want to find out where the growth stories are. I recognize this is a new normal. We're talking about a low growth story, but we all want to find out where the bright spots are. But Min, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, you also raised a very interesting question about the, the, the oil, low oil price and why it did not push for the consumption. Because there's also a structure change. When we say oil price drop, we always say it's just a redistribution of the wealth. Right, from export to the import. And before 10, 15 years ago, the export have very lower consumption elasticities. They save three quarters of their profit into the overseas investments. So stimulating for the consumption is limited. When you move to the import side, if oil price is lower, every penny they, they get is a rainfall, right? They consume. Today is complete change. Mm. Because all your export country use up to more than 90% of their profit to consume. So the consumption elasticity against oil price is way, way high. And in advanced economy, consumer elasticity against oil price is much lower. So that's what we see in the United States, the consumer's household saving risk increase rather than decrease, they save part of their, 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 their income from the low oil price rather than spend all of this to the other grocery shoppings. Yeah. I mean, this is a big consumer behavior change, also reflect in a certain way why do you think, the do you uncertainty. Think that, do you think that's because of 2008 or for Yeah, other? because yeah. the balance is repairing and that's uncertainty. Right. And right. also people understand that you're going to live longer, you need more money that's for the right. future. They I'd yeah. like to frame it a little bit differently, but, but I agree with what you said about the consumer. Um, in, uh, in the United States, a tremendous amount of infrastructure, not just direct infrastructure of oil exploration, but um, infrastructure surrounding it, um, uh, had been built up based upon uh, certain expectations of price and uh, um, uh, profitability. Um, therefore, there was a balance when oil prices collapsed but uh, I felt and feel that the, the benefit to consumers is diffuse and turns out to have gone more into savings. Uh, but the uh, detriment to those places, uh, companies, places, uh, uh, debt, uh, capital structures uh, that relied upon the continuation of medium to high prices was very direct and very impactful, as well, of course, uh, being very impactful on emerging markets um, and places that explore for oil. There's one more uh, part of the uh, oil equation that's worth putting into the mix, and that's the geopolitical on the supply side. Um, Iran is coming into the mix. Um, Saudi Arabia is, um, um, uh, has challenges to, um, to its uh, political stability uh, 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 and uh, other places uh, that uh, drill uh, and uh, export oil um, are under various uh, potential geopolitical challenges. And I think I think those things are not necessarily long-term impacts on the, um, uh, the oil markets, but they certainly could cause 
uh, disruptions in volatility. This is a really important point, and I wonder if you all believe that part of the uncertainty and worry out there is what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, this most recent upset between the Saudis and Iran and some other countries following Saudi Arabia's lead in cutting ties with Iran, is this also an underpinning to, to the uh, uh, uncertainty out there, the fact that we're seeing the Middle East issues worsen? I mean, I want to say yes, but at the same time, historically, that's usually translated into will the oil price go up? And if the oil price goes up, that's going to cause a problem. Okay. So, but, you I mean, know, I, can, a- I mean, on the central bank question, can the Federal Reserve in the U.S. raise interest rates in 2016 when all of its colleagues around the world, Japan, Europe, are lowering interest rates? Well, it, if you know, it depends on where the U.S. economy is going. So if U.S. labor markets continue to tighten uh, and the U.S. Eco- domestic demand continues to be strong, it certainly can. I mean, if this continues, then obviously they won't. They'll be looking to go into reverse. But on the other hand, I mean, I'm not sure that it will. I mean, I, I bet they do raise interest rates further. Uh, I don't think that's a decisive factor in what's going on. Well, I the don't. Strong, well, the strong dollar has put pressure on U.S. multinational profits, and that's, yeah. caused, that's caused more of a trigger on this issue of cost control. And you know, if I look at the, the 16 budgets, when you look at the strength of the U.S. dollar, that's causing more pressure in the system to cut costs. It, 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 certainly, it certainly hits the stock prices and U.S. profits. It doesn't necessarily translate quickly into employment because everything's priced in dollars and the short run impact there is not as large. Let, let me just come back to you know, the question you raised. I mean, there, if an economy is growing at three or four, whatever it is, uh, that means that certain sectors can grow at sort of six or eight, and some can go at zero. Some can be at negative, some can be at higher positive rates. Now, just take the automotive industry, which is key. And I just went to CES, and I went to the Detroit Auto Show. A lot so of you, technology now so, in the yeah. auto business. Well, you, you see more technology at CES on auto than you do in Detroit, which is interesting in and of itself because it tells you a little bit about the disrupted technology. But if you're running an automotive company, what do you face? Singapore has an RFP out for a driverless car zone, which, as far as I know, Google are, are bidding for, GM is bidding for, and Continental are bidding for. Uh, uh, Oslo has announced it will have a car-free zone by 2019. I think another city has already. Yeah, triggered. this is most really mayors, interesting. Most mayors will do this. Uh, Milan is in the midst of a car-sharing experiment. It's reduced the sales of autos by 10%. So if you're running <clears throat> an automotive company, which is a legacy company, you have to switch. And by the way, another thing, 3D printing. I saw a two-seater sports car, full-size, which was 3D printed with the exception uh, of seats are and tires. Are you kidding me? No, absolutely true. Unfortunately, it was on CNBC, <laughs> uh, sport box, but, but, but it, it was. So it, it can't be true. No, uh, it, 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 it. So we, we saw it. I, don't, I didn't see it working, but that I saw it. That is fascinating. So, so what does this mean for somebody who's running? And, so you have to make some big bets. Yeah. Unless you're insulated, you take Ford, which is our largest client, it is insulated. Well, it's it can, also it doing make, driver, it it's make trying to do its own drivers. It can make the investments that it needs to make. I agree. There's a massive attack on the global auto business right now. How many people in the audience would put their family in a driverless car? How many people would not put their family in a driverless car? It's interesting. More people would not. But the truth is, is with a driverless car, you don't have to worry that the, that the driver is texting. You don't have to worry that the driver didn't get enough sleep, had alcohol last night, and the driver knows everything, or the driverless car knows everything around them. Although I'm, I think I might be with the people who, who, who are not going to put a family in a driver. <laughs> I don't know why, but, um, but it's interesting when you look at disruption. Yeah, but the, point, the point is that people who, who, and most of the businesses we're talking about that have a, an impact on employment are legacy businesses. I'm using that word. That's a bad word to use, but they are they're rooted in, in older technologies. The disruption causes tremendous disruption to long-term thinking too, uh, unless you're insulated. And I think it's really interesting that the, the companies that we deal with, yeah. are the insulated, uh, with the do well, I think are the insulated companies. Well, we, I'm, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, on the technology side, I mean, Paul and Martin, you know, mentioned all this new, everybody see so many new innovations in the product pump out. But the mystery is the key issues. We see productivity still on downward trends, right? 
So there's two, there's only two answers for that. Number one, that's a management issue. Right, so they are not properly measured into the GDP growth or whatever. <coughs> and uh, I think that's, that, that, that's possible. We still don't know how to measure those issues. But uh, clearly, another issue is those technologies haven't been industrialized. I think that's very important. We haven't seen the things that bring all the technology together. I mean, the driverless car could be one, but uh, unless... An, and until it's industry and commercially in the scale is not there. See, I think healthcare, That's the it. disruption going on in healthcare and the fact that we have such longevity now is really one of the growth stories. We have to get the, the growth stories where you all believe there is growth and will be growth in the global economy. And I also want to get to the issue of liquidity, Paul, which you mentioned to me early. But first, let's get some interaction from the audience. Question for our uh, first class panel right here. We have microphones uh, walking around, and we would love to hear, yes, sir, right here in the front, and uh, John Studinsky as well. Thank you. The subject of this panel is preventing future shocks. We have talked a lot about the past and the present, but I would like to hear what should we do fundamentally to prevent f future shocks? Thank you for that very important question. Paul. I think the most uh, significant thing that can be done to prevent uh, future shocks that are preventable um, uh, is deleveraging uh, the financial system. Um, over a period of 40 years or so, um, the major financial institutions in the world have uh, evolved from being banks to basically being uh, banks uh, and investment banks together with the largest and most leveraged trading firms in, on, the, uh, uh, on the planet. Um, through the use of derivatives. Um, each one of the major financial institutions has a balance sheet that looks something like 150 to $200 billion of capital, uh, equity and preferred, um, two to $3 trillion of assets, balance sheet assets, and uh, at present, 40 to $80 trillion notional amount of derivatives. Um, it's still opaque, it's still highly leveraged. These derivatives are largely, although notional amounts are not the um, <clears throat> proper measure of risk. Um, among that, uh, those trillions are the effective equivalent of balance sheet assets, um, but you can't figure it out from disclosures. And so um, there's no reason, in my view, why major financial institutions shouldn't be a, a margined like customers so that they are sound. If they were sounder, um, uh, and I disagree with Sir Martin uh, in the way he framed um, the growth up to 2008, uh, and then the growth uh, subsequent to 2008. It wasn't that the economy um, uh, uh, crashed or the global system crashed because it couldn't grow at those rates. It was that it was over leveraged and very vulnerable in a way that policymakers, financial institution heads, as well as investors didn't understand. And so deleveraging the financial system um, would go a long way towards, uh, and is the single biggest uh, uh, element. Now, we, we've seen a lot of deleveraging de this year, by the way. So you're saying deleverage if you're a corporation, individual, uh, government, just de continue the deleveraging. I'm talking about the financial system, the, just financial, the financial institutions, system. and they have, it has come down. But if you look at uh, 1970 or 1980, 2007, and today. Mm. So today, the leverage is lower than in 2007. Mm -hmm. But 2007 was insane. Um, and uh, today, compared to uh, when banks were sound and weren't uh, primarily trading vehicles, that, um, that's good. I, I would that's argue good. preventing I would future argue shocks. That, I would argue oh, that the leverage increased increased the growth rate. The corporate sector is probably deleveraged to a very significant degree, and to some extent, you've got a, a lot consumer. of capital at this that, point. A lot of over, over. In fact, it's the opposite with the corporate sector. I think the corporate sector has to be encouraged to take risk. Yeah, I think the deleverage is important, but it's not enough. I mean, it's a, what else? Overall How situation. else do you prevent future shocks? The shot? key challenge for your question, we're suffering in the past, we're going to continue to face in the future, we still don't fully understand is the global interconnectivity and the spillover. We live such close interconnected world and every small activities events will spill over across the whole financial market. The financial market co-movements across different class of assets increased dramatically. Before crisis, 
the market could move, could move from you know, the emerging market equity advance and the, the, the bonds, equity, whatever, high yields, 20%. During the crisis, 80%. Today, around 50 to 60. And any time market volatiles, go back to 80%. If a market move in the same direction, 80% correlation, how do you prevent the crisis? But, hmm. I think that's the real, real challenge. In the past 12 months, we observe the largest volatility. For example, in the US equity market, four times the deviation one day against the 100-day averaging since 1932. Mm. In the bonds market, six times deviation, standard deviation widened against the 100 days uh, moving average since 1970s. Last year, we observed so many volatilities break the records in the history because it's co-movements and interconnectivities. But, but further, let me add this further, even worse, what we document, we found, when the market moved together, the real scary thing is the liquidity circle dramatically. Theoretically, you can think about that. If everybody moving to together, want to say, I want to buy, I want to move things, you don't have liquidity at all. Yeah, the liquidity, What we observe yeah. is a really key issue. When the, it's close, so close associated with Co-movements increase upside, the, the liquidity drop immediately. So then the key issue is when market have uncertainty, have anticipated events that happen, rip out the whole world systems, the, the spill over, and the market volatiles, and the liquidity is so dramatically, which scares everyone. Yeah, and I want so to get in that sense, let me, let me liquidity put the two later. policy, I think it's but, very but, important. For the macro level, I think clearly for the policymaker today, regulators, you have to understand the situation. You have to be ready to act very fast, very fast. Very important. And also for the corporate sector, you've got to understand this huge volatility, but short-term volatility. It's not a meltdown, let me emphasize again. It's a huge volatility, but mm. short. You've got to have enough buffer to prepare. It's mm. a huge shock. Short. Know what you're dealing with. Get in front of it. Yeah, can can that's, your that's, thoughts that's, that's, on but, preventing future shocks? Yeah, but I, I think the sensitivity is a reflection of the over-leveraging that Paul was talking about. And uh, in a lot of countries in Europe, the lever leverage has not come down you know, very much. We have a lot of zombie banks. China has been leveraging up like crazy. The United States has sort of had microscopic deleveraging in some sectors. You're talking about the financial sector. Yeah. Well, the financial sector is deleveraged more. No, I, and and I, I think the f way forward in the financial sector is to have require much greater equity for banks and to have new financial instruments that uh, are, are less, sensi less uh, sensitive to bank runs and, and, and such. So, you know, I, th I think really what we're talking about with policy, you can't stop countries from having... Uh, frictions, wars, migration problems, productivity shocks, you can try to not amplify them when they come. Mm. I think that's really what you can work on. Of course, we'd like to guess what global warming is going to be and what trends are going to be, but we, we have a system that amplifies shocks. And, and certainly the global connectivity is very important, yeah. although I think a part of this is the leverage. And then that's making when the central banks move a little, everybody jumps. Right. And, and I think what you said earlier in terms of fiscal policy was very important. Do you feel that... Nothing on the geopolitical front. There is nothing to be done on the geopolitical front to prevent future shocks. What do you think should be done, sir? No, it, it, this is a question for Martin. No, it's not. <laughs> Far be it from me, that's more for you than it is for me. Well, it's an important <laughs> question because that really has been where the uncertainty has been. Uh, putting markets aside, uh, global uncertainty. Yeah, in fact, Geopolitical we're missing, issues. We're, we're missing a, a good uh, global coordination. Yeah. And I think that there is much more to be done uh, from our leaders, our political leaders, uh, mostly in the Western world, but certainly with the newcomers into better coordination. Yeah. Because the lack of coordination has created as, as a consequence a lot of these uh, problems that we, have, we are observing. And coordination means negotiation. A negotiation means, well, give and take. Mm. But I think that if we take a, a long-term view to the problems and uh, we act in a coordinated way, 
We have to accept in short term some adjustments, but we have at least a direction where to move and our leaders are responsible for achieving yeah. that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We have two questions here, John Sudinsky and Lucky Izawa from Japan. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Maria, thank you for organizing uh, and orchestrating a very feisty discussion here this morning. Um, preventing uh, future shocks, I'm going to take Carlos's um, word of leadership. Uh, the elephant in the room, from my perspective, is leadership. Um, the activist community, Paul, you've talked about it. Activists generally go after situations where they feel there's a, a dearth of leadership or direction. Martin talking about M&A and strategy. Companies need leadership. Uh, Min talking about capital expenditures. A lot of that, the perception now among shareholders is chief executives lack a sense of direction and leadership. In the future, what are the two or three ingredients required or characteristics required for the real, true leaders of the future? Because there is a theory that a lot of the uncertainty right now in the markets, a lot of the turbulence is just a pure reaction to a perceived lack of leadership, it's certainly in the corporate sector, in the government sector. Mm. Thoughts on leadership, gentlemen? Well, you moderated the presidential debate, so what do you think? <laughs> well, Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, and I think that uh, during that debate, uh, we were able to draw out uh, some, some ideas in terms of fiscal policy, like tax policy, like immigration. Um, and these are, look, these are the fundamental issues for the people, as well as the geopolitical uh, story. There are a number of leaders, I think, uh, who are up for the job. But, we'll see uh, what but, the people but, believe. You know, coming to, coming to John's point, point yeah, yeah, but, but the corporate but sector mirrors... Allocation. The corporate sector, I think, John, mirrors what you see politically. I mean, let's take the UK for a minute. Uh, we have a fixed uh, five-year election now. Uh, I get the feeling, uh, this is not a criticism, I, I think it's just a political fact, that the, the government, uh, Conservatives, with a clear majority, uh, that the Chancellor who's now the COO of the government, he's no longer the CFO, he's more than the, and potentially the CEO, is thinking about what happens in 2020. So we will see the UK economy be, not, not it will do well, I think, it, but it will not be as robust as it's been in the last few years, you know, gearing up for an election in 2020. In other words, we get into these cycles, and they can be four years, five years, six years, depending on what the political cycle is. In the corporate area, I, I think, you know, we've been at it at WPP for 30 years, right? Um, some people say that's too long. Um, but I, I think it has enabled us to think about the long term. So when Maria says, where's the growth? Despite all that's happening, despite the new normal, right? Which I think is the thing. Where do we see the growth? There's, there's growth in the fast growing markets. We look 25 years hence, the bricks and the next 11, is still a concept that we think is fundamental. So you still think good. that the emerging then, markets will be the leaders yeah, in terms of growth? Don't call them emerging, it's insulting. China is the second largest economy in the world. It's emerged, okay. right? It's a fast growing market saying, yeah. that has slowed down, but it's still fast growing. If you believe the 6.9, it's still fast growing. It's a 10, 11 trillion dollar market, even if it's growing at four. It's the delta is greater than the US economy this year. So BRICS and next 11, I'm still pinning the hopes of WPP for the next 30 years on that. Digital is 40% of our business. We're still pinning, pinning our hopes on that. Data, still. So there are growth sectors, because even if the economy, as I said, is growing at three or 4%, there are fast growth sectors. You have to avoid the slow growth. So there's still, but I think to John's point, the leadership has to come around long-term vision. And so I, I really applaud the efforts that are being made in the corporate sector, which is where we interact most most, most of our time, not all of our time, but most of our time, in the corporate sector to set a vision, to stick to it, and not be subject to the vagaries of short-term, short-termism, which I think is the fundamental problem that uh, we face in the corporate sector. Okay, thank you for identifying growth stories. Go ahead, Paul. Um, I think John's question is a very important question. I have uh, two comments on two aspects of it. It's not a comprehensive comment on leadership in corporations, but two things that affect it. Um, um, structural. Um, 
When, for example, financial institutions migrated uh, uh, several decades ago from privately owned to uh, publicly owned, publicly traded, I think a very important change in incentives, disincentives, um, attention to risk, stewardship, culture uh, were thrown into the garbage can and uh, in a very harmful way, which I believe uh, had this had a denouement in, uh, uh, in uh, the fall of 2008. Um, uh, also structural in terms of corporate governance, and I'll focus on America for this one. Um, the, um, the idea, um, real briefly, the idea in America is that shareholders in a public, and it's, it's brought America a great amount of prosperity, but I, I believe it's deeply damaged at this point. Um, Shareholders elect a board of directors, which sets strategy and hires the management and uh, uh, has, um, uh, has supervision of the management. I think that model is broken. I think uh, in a lot of cases, management selects the board of directors. In a lot of cases, um, I recommend to everyone looking at the composition of the boards of directors of every major global financial institution in the summer of 2008. It could be 2007, 6, and it could be today, actually. But uh, look take at your a look, board. Look at the board and see what proportion of board members are actually experts in the particular business, uh, understanding the particular industry or sub-industry or subsector. And that will versus, exhibit leadership to you. Versus uh, versus um, um, uh, versus luminaries, etc. Um, the leadership point is that the um, the um, leaders that are selected by a process that they're not selected, they select the boards and they're entrenched, and the institutional community uh, just reflexively supports them, which is evolving and changing. Yeah, but this is a very good that, point, yeah, Paul. In that world, um, you get leaders, you get some great leaders, you get some, uh, some very ordinary leaders, mm. and you get some people that, um, that uh, uh, shareholders and stakeholders, because debt holders um, so are how also- So how would you alter the structure? Um, I'd actually, um, I, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I'd actually address it uh, in the United States legislatively and by, by rules concerning elections. Separating um, chair, elections. chairman and CES? I don't think that's such an impactful... Uh, but challenge. make sure that people on the board have a clear understanding of the business, where it's going, not just that they have a relationship with the CEO. I think that's something that could be self, yeah. self-selected, but yes, that Very would be... Very important. Um, I don't, uh, but I don't have a we have about five tonight. minutes left. I certainly want to get Min uh, and, and, and Ken and Paul, your ideas in terms of where growth is. But we want to hear from Lucky Izawa right now from Japan. Real quick, Lucky. Uh, I'm Lucky Izawa, uh, BlackRock Japan CEO. BlackRock Japan. Yeah, I changed. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting discussion. It's the last uh, three weeks, uh, uh, world is a uh, uh, turbulence. It's, uh, uh, it's especially in Japan. It's uh, the uh, stock price market is terrible. But we have to think about the uh, uh, more and more longer term uh, vision. Uh, I am on the base of the uh, long term view. The, uh, uh, he asked the question, the leader's role of the, uh, 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 for longer term uh, vision. Uh, Mr. Singer replied, very good answer. Uh, the uh, corporate governance or chairship, this is very important. For future, the preventing the future risk is uh, uh, each corporation and the, uh, make it uh, healthy and uh, uh, sustainable growth. It's very important. And I think uh, four things I ask the, uh, uh, each, uh, uh, we ask uh, each uh, uh, top management in the world one is uh, uh, capital investment more. And the second one, the R&D investment more. Third one is the uh, human resource investment, investment to the human resource. And the fourth, depending on the company, a wage up. This is on the base of the uh, top management leader, what should do. The, uh, generally speaking, Japan, the US, and Europe, the, uh, uh, Large companies uh, are mostly uh, sitting on the cash. Right. So when are we going to see that cash move and, yeah. and do those kinds of things that you're talking yeah. about? Investing yeah, right. in CapEx, investing yeah. in R&D. That, that and comes in I like to ask them. Seeing, seeing wages move higher. Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, make uh, two points quickly, sort of a response to your question. For the first issue is a gentleman's point, the geopolitical uh, crisis. 
uh, uh, crisis and the risk. I would say this year, the political risk is the key risk. We still have a growth, 3.4. Right. It's not as strong as we want, we thought, but still 3.4. We had a market volatility, 10 points, but market still does not melt down as I disagree with you. But I think the political risk today is really the key risk, which imply we're facing a lot of uncertainties and a lot of shocks. I think that's we need to keep in mind because those things is hard to predict, hard to understand, but things link to each other. I think that's the key issue is really, if we're look, look, uh, looking to the prevent for the future shocks, that's the key area, although we don't know how. But I think we have to. And you just dinged yeah. the capital investment budgets of most major private corporations, yeah. the corporate but, sector, but, but the, by, the, by introducing further risk. No, 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 no. The, the second issue is uh, uh, response to your question, the where the growth come from. I would say globally, growth come from structural reform. Structural reform. Because clearly, we, we, we don't have aggregate demand, right? We don't have a fiscal policy space. We don't have a monetary policy space. Interest rates are zero already. That takes me back to what Paul yeah. said, and that is so things like only, tax reform. But there are huge room for the structural reform. The product market reform, labor market reform, and the pension reform, tax reform. I think that's the huge area for the potential growth yep. for the whole world. All the politicians, policy makers should put the efforts in this area to promote the growth for today and for tomorrow. Okay, so yeah. we need structural reform for, for growth, and that's where you're finding it. Ken Rogoff, where is the growth in the yes. world, and where will it be? Well, reinforcing this point, if you don't have good institutions, if you don't have good governance, if you don't have good leadership, nothing's going to help. You can have all the technology in the world. You're not going to get growth. We do have a lot of technology. Fourth Industrial Re Revolution, I don't know, but a lot of things. A lot of it's frozen up because there's not investment. We've gone through what I call a debt super cycle. China's the last leg of it. We're still emerging. But I think in the long run, if you get these things straight, you don't have to get everything straight, just something straight, some improvements. It's been pretty lame the last few years. Then I think we can see growth, artificial intelligence, the medical sector, et cetera. So there, exactly, there are growth stories in the world. Final, final moment here. You mentioned liquidity is an issue, Paul Singer. Uh, touch on that and give me your recommendation for growth. I think um, uh, liquidity and the changes in the liquidity posture of markets um, is a kind of an overlay to everything that we've been saying on this, uh, on this panel. And I think there's no question that it's, um, it's, it's diminished and the prospects are that if what's happening in the last couple of weeks turns into something uh, significant, it's not yet, I agree, it's not yet a meltdown, but uh, something significant, the, some of the moves of the last few years have given some indication that, um, that at some point things could be very disorderly. The August 24th episode, several flash crashes. Um, bank liquidity has been sharply impacted. Anyone here who's a, who's a banker knows the constant regulatory pressures to, um, uh, to reduce positions, to, uh, uh, to uh, fire customers, in effect. Uh, a lot of my peers have been ejected from H prime H brokers. Hedge fund closures. Yes. It well, sounds like no, you're expecting closures. things to get worse before they get better. I'm saying that if they get worse, uh, if they get worse, the liquidity posture of markets, a combination of banks lowering liquidity, this new force of sovereign wealth funds, uh, very few people are thinking about that as a and, liquid, and there, liquidity. There are also commodity companies that are under tremendous pressure. Sure. We're, we're going to see probably, some, yeah. talking to some hedge funds last night, some, some bankruptcies, Chapter 11s in commodity sectors. Because sector. of the Ener commodities energy breakdown. Se energy One more sector. element. Yes. One more element. Uh, I think no, uh, very few people are focused on this. Um, to the extent that securities prices, stocks and bonds, particularly bonds around the world, are distorted in price by central bank uh, buying, um, there's a potential for a tectonic shift if uh, holders of uh, those securities um, decide that they've lost confidence in central bankers for any one of a host of reasons. Mm. So liquidity is a concern of mine uh, uh, going forward. I couldn't uh, uh, put it any better than Ken in terms of uh, uh, global growth. Um, we've discussed the elements, leadership and governance. Uh, et cetera, uh, uh, policy. I think, I think Martin and Min, you are a, a bit more positive. Well, there, there is growth there. I mean, the corporate sector, 
corporate profits is a proportion of GMP at all time high? Yeah. Yeah? Labor, actually, it's a proportion of GMP at all time low. No, that's low, yeah. yeah. That's the issue. So that's the, the balance issue. This is, uh, has been a very smart uh, discussion, and I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Ken Rogoff, Zhu Min, Martin Sorrell, and Paul Singer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.